By now, I'm sure you've heard about the Kilauea volcano eruption in Hawaii that's forced evacuations and made urgent the need to predict what will happen next. What you may not know is that NGA has long supported disaster relief efforts by providing imagery and products, and also that NGA is part of a committee that is currently assisting the state of Hawaii with its volcano-related efforts. Stay tuned to learn more about how the Civil Applications Committee helps first responders respond quickly, evacuate residents safely, and prepare for future disaster scenarios. Space-based geolink capabilities help provide U.S. defense officials and policymakers understanding of adversaries and world events. But the user base for these capabilities goes far beyond the military and the intelligence community. Through the Civil Applications Committee, or CAC, federal agencies and entities can leverage these capabilities for many different domestic and international applications. As its name might suggest, the CAC focuses its efforts on remote sensing support for the federal civil community, allowing civilian agencies to request access to classified images for non-military, non-classified purposes. In 2010, the committee expanded its mandate to include commercial imagery contracts procured by the United States Department of Defense and the intelligence community. The U.S. Geological Survey manages the CAC, acting as liaison between the intelligence and defense communities and the civil agencies. The CAC coordinates and filters requests from federal civil agencies, which are then approved by NGA. The CAC then converts the images into a declassified product and disseminates the information while protecting intelligence sources and methods. We talked to Dan Upstall and Rick Wessels to learn more about the CAC mission and what day-to-day -day operations are like. So my name is uh, Dan Opstall, and I work over in uh, the National Civil Applications Center. Um, my job there is to be the Civil Applications Committee Executive Secretary. And the idea behind the Executive Secretary is to support um, the efforts of the um, Civil Applications Committee, which is a group that facilitates the appropriate federal civil use of remote sensing data, emphasis on facilitate and appropriate. Uh, for a wide variety of applications. And, and what we're doing is we're using the, the DoD and IC remote sensing collection systems and the commercial remote sensing contracts for kind of other missions outside of the Department of Defense. Uh, they are a broad range of science, uh, disaster response missions. Uh, they include um, uh, volcanoes, which we're going to talk a lot about a little bit more here in a minute, uh, sea ice, glaciers, um, tracking wildland fires, uh, uh, natural disasters such as hurricanes and earthquakes, floods, uh, invasive species monitoring, and ecosystem change. So it's just a wide variety of, of missions from a, a big set of interagency partners. So we have a, a, a number of interagency partners at the, at the um, department level. Our principles include interior, agriculture, commerce, health and human services, transportation, the uh, domestic side of the Army Corps of Engineers, the Coast Guard, EPA, FEMA, the National Science Foundation, and NASA. Mm -hmm. And then we have some associate members within the um, IC community and some ex officio members that oversee us, um, the Juent Committee, the DNI, and the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy. So we have a broad committee that meets together monthly mm -hmm. and is able to uh, kind of work out all of the other uses of remote sensing that I described outside of the Department of Defense in conjunction with all of our partnerships there within mm -hmm. the IC and the DOD. And we have another special guest with us today. And I'm uh, Dr. Rick Wessels. I'm a geophysicist with the uh, Volcano Science Center, which is mostly concentrated in the western part of the U.S. with all of our volcano observatories. And I and one or two others are located in the D.C. area um, to basically handle some of the issues that come up here. So I'm, I'm actually co-located in the USGS National Civil Application Center along with Dan. Um, and I also have offices in a couple other places, but I spend a lot of my time there looking at data of volcanoes around the world. So we have a global mission as well as domestic mission, and, and I help with the 200-plus volcanoes we consistently monitor there. So you've been quite busy, and we'll, yeah. <laughs> we'll get to that a little <laughs> There's bit. There's always something <laughs> erupting somewhere. Right. <laughs> We'll get to that in a second, but um, Dan, can you tell us a little more about NGA's role in the Civil Applications Committee? 
Um, sure, absolutely. So NGA's role within the CAC is to help serve as a, uh, as oversight and help us make sure that we accomplish the, the missions within our charter and the charter of the CAC. Um, the charter of the CAC is a uh, is an effort signed by the Director of National Intelligence and the, the uh, Secretary of the Interior, and it, it looks um, at a wide range of, of the science and disaster response applications that we talked about. NGA, being the functional manager of GEOINT, um, has made uh, USGS as a principal member and the CAC as an associate member within this sort of larger GEOINT community that we call the National System for Geospatial Intelligence. Let's take a Zach Morris-style timeout to explain what functional management is. Dan says NGA is the GEOINT functional manager, but actually it's the director of NGA, currently Director Robert Cardillo. Essentially, the functional manager provides the strategic management for a specific functional area in the intelligence community. In our case, that's GEOINT. So the GEOINT functional manager provides guidance to assure that everyone using GEOINT has the same standards, training, technical tradecraft, and so on. And the GEOINT functional manager serves as the principal geospatial intelligence advisor to the director of national intelligence. Being the GEOINT functional manager is a duty separate and distinct from being the director of NGA. The goal is to improve effectiveness and efficiency within and across the entire GEOINT community. Now back to Dan and Rick. And so we, we all work together. Um, the mission sets are different, but they're complementary, and we're all using remote sensing technologies. So what this is really about is it's a good government story. It's an ability of the national sensors and the commercial sensors that are acquired by DOD to be able to be used for other missions as possible. Um, it's not to for, you know, forsake or, or alter anything that NGA does as a combat support agency, but to augment Use it for another application. Use it for different applications, yeah. lots of creative uh, efforts that we can do in terms of tracking sea ice, in terms of mm -hmm. tracking volcanoes, wildland fires. There's a such an incredible volume of missions that mm -hmm. the remote sensing community takes on, and, uh, and we're kind of pleased to be able to have that link to NGA. And what is the request process like? So we know that, you know, NGA can't, won't look at any imagery or over the homeland without being requested by a lead federal agency, such as FEMA, for a natural disaster. So, and FEMA is one of the most prolific users of, of the CAC, right? So what is that request process like? Oh, sure. So uh, the CAC maintains an oversight role um, through a, uh, a series of uh, civil domestic tasking memoranda. We make sure that all the appropriate rules are followed with respect to intelligence oversight and um, in, ensure that when tasking goes in, that it's being done for a federal statutory mission and with a federal connection. Mm -hmm. the, the work of the CAC is not to, uh, uh, does not kind of preclude any agency from working directly with NGA, but this is a sort of a block group that can help kind of put together perspectives that are different from the combat support side of things mm -hmm. and the combatant commands and allow that perspective to kind of come forward mm -hmm. in discussions. So. And what are some of the other, for both of you, I mean, what what other reasons would they would requests come in? You know, what, what would they use the imagery or data for? Um, there's all sorts of science questions out there. And since the IC community, you know, NGA, NRO have some fairly exquisite assets up there, we want to make sure they're fully utilized for every question, not just mm -hmm. the national security. And so we we go after everything from looking at floods to fires to um, volcanoes, the aftermath of er earthquakes, because we're not so good at seeing them beforehand, um, and just uh, lots of, and we actually have a lot of people working on wildlife studies, tracking wildlife, uh, looking for, you know, polar bears in the Arctic, things like that that you can do with, you know, good satellites. So it's, it's a pretty wide spectrum, and the USGS's mission covers that whole spectrum as well. So NGA is an obvious partner because they have the expertise with these kinds of data and what's possible. And it's more than just imagery, right? Other geospatial products or data as well? Oh, oh absolutely. You know, LIDAR, um, you know, a wide variety of geospatial data sets, they all come into play. Um, one of the things we looked at, too, is, is this development of, of the data science aspects of remote sensing, right? So now increasingly, um, if you're dealing in the, in the aftermath of, say, a nuclear meltdown of some sort, like of the style that happened in, with Fukushima Daiichi, 
you might be dealing with well, how many vehicles are in a particular area mm -hmm. and they've been wiped out. You need to get a count of the number of vehicles. So no longer is the answer I need imagery, it's I need to know how many vehicles are in that particular image. Mm -hmm. And if right. you want to go further and really get into the, the, the science and engineering of things, then someone from, say, EPA might be a great person to reach out to because they understand, okay, mm -hmm. this vehicle contains this kind of uh, effluence that might be released, mm -hmm. you know, because of this disaster. So there's mm -hmm. a real level of detail that these organizations can, can get into that uh, uh, where they have expertise. And that, that expertise is essential now. We have so many satellites, thankfully. I mean, it's a great great era to be a remote sensing scientist because between the DOD and the civil assets and the commercial assets and then around the globe there's other countries have you know freely open data you need to have these smart systems now that are looking at all the data because it's hard for even a small group of people to possibly stay on top of all these data mm -hmm. look for every change that we need to know so the data science side which NGA is really pushing forward is, is mm -hmm. really useful especially for change detection which is a lot of what we do yeah and I would imagine for that, um, even things like archive imagery, you know, going back and mm -hmm. looking at to be able to look at the change um, now versus, you know, sometime in the past could be very useful as well. Yeah, it's nice because our volcano archive goes back to the early 1990s, starting kind of with Pinotubo eruption in the Philippines. And we still have all that online at the USGS. So if, you know, even though I wasn't there at the time, I can go back and see what others were describing in their notes. And, you know, so it's really essential for me to understand what different kinds of uh, activity look like. Mm -hmm. and, uh, we also at the National Civil Application Center maintain a global fiducials library, which uh, is a collection of over 500 environmentally sensitive sites that have been monitored for um, uh, in excess, in some cases, of 20 plus years. And that allows real ability to monitor um, a, a changing environment. And obviously, so talking about real world examples of this, um, you know, everyone's probably familiar with the volcano erupting at Kilauea. Um, what have you been working on? You know, what is that like in the aftermath of that or leading up to it even? Yeah, well, leading up to it was already getting kind of busy um, because we, thankfully, with volcanoes, we usually most of the time get some sort of signal ahead of time. So we started getting earthquake swarm. We saw a big event where all of a sudden all the lava drained out of the Pu'u'u'u -oh -oh crater. That's usually a bad sign. And then it started draining out of the main summit crater. And usually when that happens, it all goes down to that lower east rift zone where all the activity is right now. So we could get a little bit of a jump on it with starting to make sure the data was being collected up and down that rift zone. And then once we saw the first ground fissures and we kind of knew where it was going to concentrate, we could focus on that area. Um, so we've been using, we've been collecting a lot of data from all sources um, and mapping the lava as it comes out where we see new fractures, new steaming, um, and it's, and we've been providing, um, luckily the USGS, we have, we've had permissions for a long time now to create map products or descriptive products of all the data we look at and, and share that with the Volcano Observatory and then they incorporate it into what they're mapping in the field. Um, so it's, try to provide them as much as we can to show them what's going on or places they might not be focused on if something new pops up. What are some of the biggest success stories, I guess, of, you know, working together, these agencies coming together, a request coming in, um, and the CAC being able to provide imagery that they needed or products? So uh, Pinatubo is one of the, the, the foundational um, really success stories in terms of the, the story behind getting data from um, various locations and providing them out to volcano scientists in the field. Mm -hmm. And and the result is, you know, chronicled in YouTube and in other places, but the, evac the successful evacuation of Clark Air Force Base mm -hmm. and Subic Bay Naval Facility, uh, saving uh, several thousand lives at, the, mm -hmm. at that particular time and making sure that... Uh, you know, equipment and material right. was also moved. And that was really yeah, USG, USGS working closely with the IC community and the DOD because some of the DOD assets were able to show us what was going on at the volcano and help inform how rapidly things were changing. We were putting in seismometers, which was part of the story, so we could see those getting quite active. But then the observations from space were critical in understanding what the hazard was and how big the evacuation should be in it you know, saved a lot of lives and a lot of uh, mm -hmm. expensive jets and things as well. 
And there's more recent stories too of, of and on the, kind of on the volca- volcano theme of um, uh, Casatochi Island. There was a there was a there were mm-hmm. some scientists out there and um, getting timely information allowed them to be evacuated because right. it's it's dangerous business mm-hmm. being on an active volcano. Right. That's an interesting one where the fish and wildlife people out there actually called the Alaska Volcano Observatory where I worked before I came here to say, why is the ground shaking? <laughs> and it's an unmonitored volcano, so our closest seismometers were 20 miles away. Uh-huh. And then our seismologist got involved, and it's like, yeah, you guys need to get off the island. It's, you know, it's, these They're are really together. large earthquakes. And, and they got off the island about 35 minutes before it had wow. a huge plenty of eruption, which is kind of the biggest kind of eruption you can have. And it just wiped, erased the island, no signs of the cabin or anything they're in, and it deposited probably 50 meters of new ash on the island and the boat they were on was getting pelted by ash and and rocks falling out of the sky wow. so it, yeah and then so there the 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 data we get from NGA helped because now we could look at the volcano and see what's happening and the eruption lasted two or three days we were able to you know add information there um, and and we've have several Alaska's full of examples where the uh, NGA cooperation is essential because the volcanoes are remote so they're almost as hard to get to as volcanoes we work on in other countries so um, so there's really no other way to get that information yeah the satellite data are essential Mm. and what are some of the biggest challenges I mean it seems like a huge undertaking of all of this back and forth and you know I'm sure there are a lot of um, rules you have to follow and you know procedures that must be met and things like that so uh, well, first of all, uh, you know, the, whenever requests like these come into the, the DOD and IC, there has to be some kind of justification. Uh, it, it has to be a nexus to a federal statutory mission. And yes, there's a wide variety of federal statutory missions, but it doesn't encompass everything. And there are areas that, uh, that we have to be very careful with in terms of authorities. Um, so that's a challenge. Uh, just like any anything else, this is a... Uh, um, uh, competition for resources, right? For you know, scarce means, and so uh, we don't always get the ability to to have the the uh, piece tasked for science that we would like to have tasked. I think the community right. would love to have more. Mm-hmm. Um, disaster support is a little bit of a different animal, but that's uh, again, you know, there are a Maybe lot of higher things in going the priority. On. Right. There's List. a lot of things going on in the world, yeah. and you know, the combat support agency role mm-hmm. takes certainly takes precedence. Um, and that's well understood, but the fact that there's a, a voice there for the civil community, is, uh, I think, is very powerful. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think the CAC has been essential, like in Hawaii or other places where, you know, domestic issues like the Kilauea eruption, multiple agencies are responding for different reasons, for evacuations, providing shelter, mm-hmm. assessing the hazard, in our case, for the USGS. And so the CAC is essential to trying to coordinate with all these agencies because everybody has their own tasking in mind at first. and. It takes a little bit to figure out, well, who needs what, and is our tasking messing up your tasking because you're asking for something different. So you know, Dan and the CAC in general have been essential in helping us work through that those things for various responses. And yeah. <laughs> it, it really takes a whole of team effort at, yeah. at NGA to help uh, assist with that, too, mm-hmm. because there's so many different angles to both the collection and the analysis of this data set. Yeah. Um, it's not a job for any one person, and working interagency is a, is its own kind of special um, type of environment. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. no one has a particular authority over one another, so working collaboratively is an absolute must. Right, and uh, and it takes time to develop good solutions. Mm-hmm. Right, in each agency we have our own mandate. So our mandate for the USGS is to monitor and you know do the science on the volcanoes and alert other agencies when there's dangerous activity. Which, but yet then you know, everybody else has their own mandates that they're trying to accomplish. And mm-hmm. With the coordination, we can actually, everybody's happy we're all accomplishing Work the things. Work together to accomplish yeah. many different missions. Right. Yeah. Yeah, there's lots of other missions outside, too. The wildland fire monitoring one is, oh, is, yeah. a, is another great one. Uh, so important to have different capabilities available um, that can... Uh, can kind of track wildland fire. Uh, the U.S. Forest Service operates two aircraft that do that kind of work, and there's additional support that, that we can provide through remote sensing means. And, uh, and that's powerful, especially when, um, uh, when you don't have capability in, in an area and you have a fast-moving wildland fire. Mm-hmm. There's, uh, um, there isn't the time 
right. to set up coordination at that point. It all has to be um, prepositioned or it has to be negotiated. Because you need the of most up to date information for evacuations, but also mm -hmm. to tell first responders where to go and where not to go. Yeah. Exactly right. right. <laughs> yeah. No, it's been uh, it's been interesting, and you know, because Hawaii is one of these cases where there's lots of you know property involved, and roads are being destroyed, and infrastructure is mm -hmm. in danger, and and that involves. Luckily, the state of Hawaii has an amazing um, civil defense uh, group that are coordinating all that, and they work really closely with the U.S. Geological Survey, and they're kind of depending on both the U.S. Geological Survey and FEMA to provide sort of the insights and what's happening in the bigger picture, and so mm -hmm. we're getting a lot of that from the NGA. Um, support and the data we get there as well. Thanks for joining the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency for another episode of our podcast, GeoInteresting. We'd love it if you would rate and review us on Apple Podcasts. And this is one case where an intelligence agency wants you to spread the word. Tell a friend about GeoInteresting. Look for us on your preferred podcasting platform or on YouTube, or read a transcript of this episode at nga.mil. This episode's music was courtesy of Lee Rosevere from his aptly named album, Music for Podcasts Volume 1, available on the Free Music Archive.